Nintendo entered kind of a weird time period when they released the Wii U. At first, it seemed incredibly promising, with one of the first main titles for it being Pikmin 3. That was a game I waited nine freaking years for, but there were also a handful of games that really demonstrated the potential this console had. Asymmetrical multiplayer with the gamepad, having it used for inventory and map screens, there was a lot of rad stuff the thing could do that was not possible in other consoles. Contrary to the Switch that had both released within the first year of launch, everyone was wondering when were they gonna drop the big Zelda and Mario games. You know, a new 3D Mario game is a big deal, and after the Galaxy games, people were very excited to see a brand new 3D Mario in HD for the very first time. But what we got wasn't something brand new, but rather an extension of something we've already seen on the 3DS. Super Mario 3D World. After the release of 3D Land, they decided to do a follow-up to it on the Wii U, and that never really made a whole lot of sense to me. I mean, this was a game made from the ground up entirely with the handheld in mind, so wouldn't it make more sense to make a new game from the ground up entirely with the Wii U in mind instead of reusing mechanics that only existed because they were restricted to a handheld device? Mario 3D World is a strange combination of reused ideas, shoehorned in gimmicks, questionable design choices, and a lot of really good level design. I've never seen an audience so split on a game. A lot of people hate this game, but it did find its niche with a cult following eventually. Yeah, there are a lot of people that genuinely love this game. Personally, I played it when it first came out back in 2013, and I beat it, and, uh... Yeah, that was kind of it, you know? Like, I remember liking it a lot, but it never really resonated with me the same way that Sunshine or Galaxy or 64 did. I never found myself looking back on this one, yet, now that I think of it, I can remember it having a lot of really impressive level design. So, why don't I remember anything from it? Why am I so hesitant to look at this game and think, yeah, this is another great Mario game? That's something I really want to figure out, and by the end of this video, I'm hoping that's something we will learn. So... Why don't we get started? Super Mario 3D World! Yeah. Title screen reminds me a lot of Mario 3's and Mario World's title screens. You know, how like you get to see the characters doing stuff on it. Kinda shows you what's new and what you can do in this game. Like, oh look, I can pick up a Koopa shell and throw it. Or like, uh, oh look, you can ride a Yoshi and gobble up some dudes. Or like, uh, oh look, you can pick up a shell and you can... Wow, you can get in the shell and ride it around. I did not know you could do that. Wow, that's sick, dude. The game opens up with Mario, Luigi, Peach, and Toad all strolling around. There's some fireworks going on in the background, so they're probably at some festival or something like that. Uh, unlike the Galaxy games, it never tells us directly, because like 3D Land, this game's story is all pantomimed out without any dialogue at all. Come to think of it, that's actually exactly what they do in the 2D games as well, and that kind of makes sense, you know, since 3D Land and World are both fashioned more or so after the 2D Mario design philosophy. So we're walking around and stuff, and we find this strange pipe all crooked and busted up. Mario and Luigi then use their extreme plumber skills to fix it up, and a bunch of crazy stuff pops out of it, including this little green fairy dude who explains that Bowser has kidnapped all of her friends. Bowser then pops out and kidnaps her and escapes down the pipe. Peach tries to reach down to help the fairy, but falls in. Mario jumps after her, with Toad shortly behind, with Luigi hopping in last. I love how Luigi hesitates and slaps his face before he goes in. It definitely captures Luigi's personality pretty well. Mario and friends then land in the Sprixie Kingdom, and now they gotta go beat up Bowser and save the little fairy dudes. I'm guessing they're called Sprixies, but I'm just, I'm just gonna call them fairy dudes, because... I don't know. Why not? So yeah, um, as expected, there's not really a whole lot to the story again. It's just, go save the things. It's at least somewhat refreshing for it not just being about pursuing the kidnapping of Princess Peach, and of course, that was done so she too could be a playable character, which is pretty cool. We don't have those little scenes between worlds like in 3D Land, though. The story doesn't really have any more meat to it once you watch that opening cutscene. And that bums me out a little bit because 3D Land had a little bit more, and 3D World just doesn't have at least a little bit more? I don't know, I would just like a little bit more. That's all I want. So the first thing you're probably going to notice about the hub world is that it's very different than 3D lands. Instead of being a straight line stage select screen, you can freely walk all around and approach any level you'd like. It is still a fairly linear game though, but there is a little bit more freedom than you had in 3D land. You'll beat one level to unlock the next still, but sometimes you'll unlock two at once and you're only required to finish one of them to move onward. It's somewhat similar to games like Mario World or 3 with the branching paths, but it's still nowhere near as 
elaborate. Actually, the pathways don't even really branch, they just kind of separate and then go back into one, so yeah, there's not really much to it. Alright, so for the gameplay, it is fairly similar to 3D Land, but it does feel a lot better. Obviously, since you get to use a real controller with a real control stick, the movement does feel a tad more accurate, but the characters will still snap to specific angles like they did before. As for the jumps this time, we've got the long jump, which is actually useful this time, the side jump, which is actually useful this time, the charge jump, which is about as useful as it was before, it's not like, you know, super useful, maybe now and then. And then we've got two more jumps added for this game. We've got the spin jump finally returning from sunshine. Hell yeah, dude, that was my favorite jump in that game. Though it doesn't even come close to being as good as it was in sunshine. I mean, look, dude, the controls are so freaking tight, I can do this thing from a standstill. But here in 3D world, you have to spin the stick until you enter this spinning animation, and then you jump, and then you kind of go, yeah, I don't know. It is pretty useful for a handful of scenarios when you need a higher jump than a side jump, and you do have enough room to execute it, but I don't know, man. The way it feels just ain't the same. The second one is a brand new jump, the ground pound jump. If you jump shortly after your ground pound, you'll jump higher. Um, yeah, it's it sure is another jump. There's nothing really that interesting about it, and I never really found many practical uses for it either, so I never really used this one. The rolling move is back, but I didn't really find it as helpful as I did before. I used it a lot in 3D land to break through blocks and stuff, but I feel with the new power-ups, I didn't really need it that much. You can also do a long jump out of the rolling animation, and that'll launch you a tad further. I never really found this that useful in 3D Land, but there were definitely times I did find myself using it here in 3D World. I find this game really puts Mario's moveset to better use. You know, like in 3D Land, you only ever really needed the standard jump for the majority of the game, but there's much more room for actually using the moveset you're given here. Interestingly enough, Mario's not the only playable character in this game. From the get-go, we've got Mario, Luigi, Peach, and Toad all as playable characters, and each one has their own physical attributes. Or is it attributes? I don't freaking know. Mario's just Mario, you know, the game's gonna tell you he's the most well-balanced character, but you know, that really just means that he doesn't play much differently than he does in any other game. Luigi plays similarly to Mario, but his jump is much higher. He does this flutter kick that increases his airtime overall. It's a little weird to get the hang of right away, but it's great once you're used to it. Toad, he can run faster. Um, I think that's all he does? So like, that's, that's cool, I guess. You don't really need that, but... Peach, on the other hand, probably has the most helpful ability in the game, the one that lets her float in the air for a short time. As a trade-off, though, she is pretty slow. I know what you guys are thinking, and yeah, this is Mario Bros. 2. It's the same cast of characters with the exact same abilities. Man, that is a game that does not get enough love. I mean, that game kicks ass, so it's really cool to finally see some homages to that game. The music from the slot machine rooms is also from Mario Bros. 2. I actually found out during this playthrough that if you hit each block in time with the music, you'll get a perfect score every single time. <laughs> That's brilliant, dude. So, being a similar game to Mario 3D Land, 3D World also sports the 2D style of power-ups, the ones that act as a crutch or a method of changing the way you play the stage, instead of being something that changes the game mechanics surrounding your objective. Returning from 3D Land, we've got the Tanuki suit, the boomerang suit, and of course the fire flower, but we've also got some extra ones as well. Of course, we've got Cat Mario. You've probably seen him in at least the game's artwork and marketing. It seems they tried to make it the whole game's thing. You know, similar to how they did the same in 3D Land with the Tanuki suit. At least this time, though, the thing is actually something new that changes the way the game is played a little bit more than the Tanuki Leaf did. Instead of simply slowing your descent and making the game just easier to get through, the cat suit provides Mario and friends with abilities that will instead change the pathways you take during a stage. You've got a swipe attack, which is similar to the tail whip, but the real game changer is how it allows you to climb up walls. Now you're gonna be scaling mountains checking out totally new areas. This gives the player the means to somewhat explore the level and take slightly different ways through the stage. Take this log ride, for example. You could be down here, chilling and cruising along, or you could be up here with the big boys, scaling the fences and hopping along the platforms. This is pretty great. They're actually realizing that untapped potential these power-ups had in 3D land. Like I said in the video about that game, Mario 3 did this really well, so I'm glad to see them attempt something
something like it again in 3D. The other major power-up they added is the Double Cherry. Grabbing one of these will create a clone of yourself. This one's super rad if you pair it with the Fire Flower or the Boomerang, since every additional clone means another set of hands to help throw projectiles. It's mostly needed for activating certain platforms that require multiple people to activate, which often hide green stars, so the challenge becomes getting to the end of the stage without your clones getting knocked out of existence. Honestly, this is one of the coolest things this entire game does. Like, you have no idea how satisfying it is to knock out tons of enemies with an onslaught of fireballs or boomerangs. The Mega Mushroom from New Super Mario Bros. also makes a couple of appearances, and uh, yeah, it, it just makes you big and invincible, and you, you plow through everything effortlessly. Cool, I guess. I feel like this would be way cooler if I were like 10 years old because now as an adult it's just like, okay, I guess now I don't have to do part of the stage. The Tanuki, Fire, and Boomerang power-ups are all widely unchanged from 3D land, though the Boomerang does feel a little better. I don't know if it's just me, but I feel like you get a little bit more range out of it this time. I easily think this game does a better job of reeling in the potential this style of power-ups had. Like I mentioned before, the Cat and Double Cherries will allow you into areas that you normally cannot access, making your playthrough of the stages a tad different each time. The Fireballs are also used to light torches, which is often done to reveal hidden green stars. This was also done in 3D land, but I I really think they did it like once in that game. Another new thing that's quite prominent throughout 3D World are the clear pipes. You'll use these to zip around the level. Sometimes they're used as transition pieces, getting you from one segment to the next. There's not really a whole lot to them at face value, but they become a brilliant piece of the stage when you realize you can throw fireballs through them. And then you've got enemies throwing fireballs through them back at you as well. And you've got fuzzy zipping through them, and then you're blasting out of them Donkey Kong style. This is one thing that 3D World absolutely excels at, and that is introducing a very simple mechanic and fleshing it out brilliantly, and then moving on to something else before it dwells too long on it. Again, like 3D Land, it does reuse some stuff from Galaxy 2, most notably the switch panels, the flip panels, and the beat blocks, but there is plenty new here as well. Dash panels that give you a burst of speed, the spiky squares that flop around the level like tox boxes, levels that have you cast a silhouette on the wall, there's a lot of really cool ideas here that are all executed very, very well. This is something I've noticed in like every linear Mario game, but I think 3D World has it down to a T. The game always introduces a new gimmick somewhere where you can learn what it does before making you deal with it in a scenario where you can actually die. I think the best example I can provide is the first time you see these flip panels in this game. It's above ground, so if you mess up, you just fall down here and you're fine, but the next segment after this one, oh buddy, now the stakes are high. You mess up and you're donezo, but this is fine because we learned how to deal with this obstacle purely by experimenting with it in an area with a safety net. Show don't tell tutorials are very important and 3D World demonstrates the perfect way to show. The Galaxy games did this as well but I feel as if they really perfected it here. Uh, this was also really evident in another game that released around the same time, the original Splatoon. That game's single player mode is the exact same way. They introduce gimmicks in an area with a safety net where you can screw up with no penalty and then they make you do it in areas where you actually have the stakes risen. If you're interested in making coherent game design that teaches the player what to do without making it overwhelming and without using any words at all, look no further than this game. This is how it's done. So, to unlock a select handful of stages you are going to have to complete to progress, you are going to have to find a certain amount of green stars. I've mentioned these a couple of times so far. Um, they're mechanically identical to the star medals from 3D Land. There's three hidden in every level, so if you really want to advance, you're going to have to at least somewhat look for these. In in addition to the green stars, every level also has one collectible stamp. You used to slap these on your Miiverse post, but since Miiverse is no longer a thing, these things are now completely useless. You still need every stamp to get 100% completion, so they may as well just add an update that just turns these into more green stars, if you ask me. There's also a couple of side things you can do to get green stars as well, so if you're having trouble finding the green stars in the level, you can just do one of these instead. Uh, the one I'm sure many people are most familiar with are the Captain Toad stages. These are brief mini games where you'll navigate a 3D isometric area trying to collect all five green stars. It's a fun little distraction. Uh, in fact, they made a whole freaking game out of it. I, I can't say much about it because I've never played it, but yeah, it's cool. We've also got these mystery boxes. These contain a series of mini challenges where you have 10 seconds to achieve a goal and then grab the green star. This could be activating all of the switch panels, defeating all of the enemies, or getting to the end of a short course. I would honestly compare this to WarioWare, like you barely have any time to figure out what you need to do, and then even less time 
time to do it. We've also got these weird levels that require you to use the gamepad. I really like playing with the Pro Controller, so it was a little bit irritating every time the game made me switch controllers just for one stage. The Captain Toad levels also made you do that, and that was kind of annoying. But yeah, it's like these dumb gimmicky levels that require you to tap on the obstacles on the touchscreen to activate them, or blow into the microphone to make the platforms go. I don't know. It's okay, I guess, but I really wouldn't have lost any sleep if they were like, yeah, why don't we just not have these levels? They feel really shoehorned in. One of them is pretty freaking cool, though. Not like because of the gamepad functionality with it, but it's just a really cool stage overall. The Japanese-themed level. You've got the sliding doors and the temples and stuff. I really liked it. But of course, the meat of the game are just the linear obstacle course stages that are very akin to the ones you'd see in 3D land. And these levels are all a blast. They're very good at teaching you what you need to do, how to do it, and you'll have a great time doing it. However, I do find the ideas are a lot um, safer than the ones we saw in Galaxy 1 and 2. I mean, I was getting excited replaying Galaxy 2. Every stage I'd see, I'd be like, oh man, this one's sick. But with 3D World, I was having a good time, but none of it really blew me away like that. So why is that? What is it about this game that feels so forgettable despite it having such good level design? I think a big part of it is the presentation. Now, firstly, the graphics are fantastic. It's beautiful, the game is colorful, detailed, the lighting effects are on point. There's some really nice depth of field going on too. I don't really like how Mario and company look like they're made of plastic, but yeah, it's a great looking game overall. But the way this is all actually presented to us can feel a tad uninvolved, I think is the word I'm looking for. You know, like the entire game plays at this one fixed angle, super pulled back and far away from the action. It's hard to feel intimate with what's going on when you're looking at it from such a wide and unchanging perspective, you know? You're always staring at every single level from one of two angles. Every single level is always made out of blocks on one of these two angles. Eventually, everything kind of starts to look and feel the same, even if the level itself is doing something widely different from the last one. I mean, like, take Mario 64, for example. Mario is always at the dead center of the screen, up close and personal. We can see what's ahead of him, what's around him. We see what he sees, and by extension, we feel very good about getting him to do what we want him to do. Everything feels varied, not just because the levels have several themes and mechanics, but because we're viewing them at constantly differing angles. There isn't one consistent way the game forces you to look at any given stage. This also applies to Mario Sunshine, Mario Galaxy, and Galaxy 2, but then 3D Land comes along and it's like, oh wait, we don't have a camera stick on this system, we don't even have a second D-pad, so we'll make it a fixed angle, and that design choice made a lot of sense because of the limitations of the console it was on. They made sacrifices to make the game play comfortably on a handheld device. But here, there's not much reason to have that. It feels like it's being held back by limitations of a console the game isn't even on. And like, yeah, you can change the angle in three variations of 45 degrees, but that really isn't much. There's not really much reason to have a fixed camera when you have all of the buttons and sticks necessary to have a fully controllable one. But even if you could freely control a camera in this game, these stages are still created with that one angle in mind. And since every single level is designed around that same angle, they all kind of start to feel the same. But here's the thing. These were not sacrifices made for no reason. You know, the angular level design, the eight directional movement, the fixed camera. This was all done to have this game's multiplayer be as accessible as possible. One of the most beautiful things about the Wii U is how it was compatible with regular Wii remotes. So like, hey, let's play some Nintendo Land. Oh yeah, you know, everyone's just got Wii remotes laying around the house because the Wii was like one of the best selling consoles ever, right? So it's really easy to grab some of these off the table and to just be able to play multiplayer. They wanted this exact same thing for 3D World, so they designed the game to be fully playable with just a Wii Remote. This meant keeping the angular isometrical level design that could be easily managed with just the eight directions of a D-pad, as well as not needing any extra buttons or sticks to adjust the camera. And of course, with up to four players on screen at once, that means pulling the camera way back so everyone can see themselves. By design, this was a game built for multiplayer. And in the process, they opted for a lot of design choices that makes the single player experience feel rather stale. And I commend them for making these simple stages so well designed and fun, I really do, but I think the core of the problem here is how they needed to keep things so strictly simple just to preserve the multiplayer. 
That said, they did make a lot of sacrifices so the game could even have multiplayer, so I guess the least I could do is check it out. I did manage to get some friends over to play the game with me. On one day, I had my friend Robbie come over and we played the two-player. It was a lot of fun. Easily way more fun than this game is on single-player. If you're willing to cooperate with each other, you can pull off some really helpful moves, like throwing each other, making it easier for one player to hit the top of the flagpole. Oh, the mystery rooms are a freaking blast on two-player. I thought these were like okay on single player, but with two people, buddy, these are awesome. It's this crazy scramble between two people to get it done ASAP. After attempting the hardest one in the game over and over and over, we both fell into the sink where our actions would make everything fall into place. The next day, I had my friends Lucas and Josh come over to play the three player. I wasn't actually able to get enough players for four player mode because, you know, when you're an adult and all of your friends have jobs and attend university, there's a lot of conflicting schedules, so it's hard to get together, but yeah, the three-player mode is where things start to get a little bit hectic. It is super fun if you're just dicking around, but if you guys are actually trying to play through the game normally, I imagine this is not the best way to do it, unless at least one person is already somewhat familiar with every stage. With so much going on on screen all at once, you guys are going to be falling off the stage over and over again and plowing through your life count. I was actually wondering for the longest time why the game doesn't use the flip panels very much, and... <laughs> I realized it's because of the multiplayer. Like, on two-player, it is a lot harder than normal, but on three-player, it's, like, impossible to do. Look at this. We had such a hard time getting anywhere in this level. Oh, no. The Plessy levels are a nightmare, too. Everyone has equal control over him, so unless there's a lot of communication going on between all of you, y'all ain't getting nowhere with this one. It's chaotic as hell, dude. Whether or not you'll enjoy that, well, that depends on who you are, but the two-player mode is a lot tamer, and I can imagine most people will have a pretty smooth experience playing just that. Man, I really dig the multiplayer in this game. I'm really glad they at least tried multiplayer in a 3D Mario game at least once. You know, 3D World may not have been the mind-blower game that every other Mario game has managed to be, but it's at least something you're only going to get playing this entry. I'm not a huge fan of this game myself, but I still feel that a lot of people give it way too much hate. Like, who cares if one game in this series didn't meet your expectations because they wanted to go for something different that time? I mean, like, they were gonna knock it out of the park next time they made a Mario game anyway, dude. I really think this game could not have been on a better console than the Wii U, purely because the wide variety and controller options made it such an accessible game. It's also pretty funny that it's widely the least popular 3D Mario, and it just so happened to be on the least popular Nintendo console. So, did I do it? Did I solve the big mystery about why this game manages to be so well designed and fun, yet so underwhelming and stale to some people? Yeah, maybe, I don't know, maybe there wasn't even much of a mystery to begin with, but either way, why don't we get into some of the stuff I do genuinely love about this game, and then some of the endgame stuff. Mario 3D World brings back some long overdue Mario enemies. Yeah, that's right, I'm talking about Spike from Mario Bros. 3. You know, them green little dudes that would borf up a Spikerino and chuck it at ya. They made them work really well in the 3D space, having them throw Spike bars instead of Spike balls. Interestingly enough, they also brought back Galoombas from Mario World. Now, there's a little bit of confusion surrounding what these things were, so basically, these enemies in Mario World, at the time of release, they were Goombas. Goombas. Goombas just look different in Mario World and they acted differently as well. Like, they no longer went when you stomped on them, instead they went and you could pick them up and chuck them around. This game retcons those weird looking Goombas as a different kind of enemy called Galoombas, and as such, they do act somewhat similar to how they did in Mario World. I think that was a really cool thing they did with this game. It never really sat well with me that these things were supposed to be Goombas, so retroactively being like, nah, I guess they were something a little different after all. I think that was a good move. But yeah, what else do we got here that they brought back for this game? What do we go? Charge and Chuck. Man, I want to see, see more enemies come from back. Mario World. Charge and Chuck. Charge and Chuck. Charge and Chuck. Charge and Chuck. I want to see, and Chuck. Chuck. I want to see <sighs> them come back. That's cool. I love Charging Chucks. They're one of my favorite Mario enemies, so it's cool to see them in 3D once again. Hey, Nitrad, you know they're in 3D World and Odyssey, right? Yes, I know. Thank you for your 10,000 comments, guys. I wasn't, like, leading up to a bit two videos later or anything.
fight. Some of the new enemies are also pretty cool. I really like the long-necked bird guys that'll try to peck at you when you run by. The ant dudes are pretty cool too. Uh, other than these two though, I didn't find many of them that interesting or memorable. The wallops do make a comeback with this variation, but I found them to be a little less interesting than they were before. Like, they don't mimic your movement or jump when you jump. Instead, they just kind of move left and right without the player's influence, and that's not really as cool. I talked earlier about the influence from Mario Bros. 2, but there's also some rad stuff from Mario 3 here too. The tank levels, the roadblock enemies, and the death jingle. All returning from Mario Bros. 3. Really nice touches right there. Another thing I just gotta praise is the soundtrack, dude. It is so underrated. A lot of these tunes are easily on par with Galaxy's soundtrack. They ditched out the orchestra in favor of a jazz band, and I think that was a great direction for Mario's sound. They'd also use jazz for Mario Kart 8 and a lot of Mario Odyssey soundtrack. Buddy, I think Mario really found his musical niche in between orchestra and jazz, and I think 3D World, that that was the game where that settled in. There's some great variety with the soundtrack here too. Sprawling Savannah is a brilliant track with its wind instruments combined with acoustic guitar before they bring in the brass. Oh, it's so good, dude. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, a lot of these songs I found myself whistling along to as I played. Oh man, the Booze Mansion theme in this game. It is freaking beautiful. It's mysterious and melancholy. So fitting for these kinds of levels. I know I don't usually spend that much time on the soundtrack in these videos, but like, that's because everyone knows about Mario's music, right? But I find this game's soundtrack is so underrated, so I wanted to give it a segment. But anyway, now on to the end game stuff. All right, so once you beat the final boss, you've got three extra worlds to go through through World Star, World Mushroom, and World Flower. World Star is a bunch of fantastic original levels, but World Mushroom and Flower are closer to what they had in 3D Land for the endgame stuff. They're just harder versions of previous levels, reusing the stage's base, but often switching out the enemies and obstacles. Man, the way it's presented reminds me a lot of Star World in the special zone from Super Mario World. Beating the second level in World Star will unlock Rosalina as a playable character. She sports the spin move from Galaxy, but she's even slower than Peach is. I never really enjoyed playing as her as much as the other characters, but it's still a cool reward for playing a little bit past the credits. So once you're done all these special worlds, you get that one final level sitting there waiting for you to unlock it. To do that, you've got to collect every green star, every stamp, and get the top of the flagpole in every level. Oh, I hate the flagpole thing. I don't want to have to redo an entire level because I messed up a jump at the end of it. There's also some levels where you really have to have the cat power up, so you gotta make sure it's survives with you to the end, and that can be a tad annoying. But at least it's nothing compared to having to beat every level again as Luigi in 3D land. Just the green stars, just the stamps, and just the flagpoles. That's all you need. The grand finale stage is pretty damn good, too. I honestly think it's the hardest level in the entire 3D series. It's easier to do on two players, since if one player dies, you can have the other wait for them to spawn back in before moving onwards. But yeah, I like this one a lot. I honestly think it's even better than the Grand Master. Galaxy and Galaxy 2. It's a great reward for 100%ing the game. Wait a minute, that's not really 100%ing the game. I know what you freaking guys are thinking. Yeah, if you want 100%, you have to beat every level as each of the five characters. Okay, now that's pushing it, but that's absolutely fine. You know why that's fine? Because you don't get anything for doing it. You get a stamp and a shiny profile picture. Who cares about that? It's so easy to ignore. Because you don't, you don't get anything for it. Hey, if you don't actually get anything from it, well, I don't care. I'm not going to do it. I ain't got no reason to do it, dude. But if you are going to hide extra content behind 100% of the game, well, then now we've got a problem, like getting the last levels in Galaxy, Galaxy 2, and 3D Land, for instance. But here in 3D World, you just get a shiny profile picture. Nothing that really matters. So, hey, dude, I think that's absolutely fine. They're acknowledging that it's something you can do, but that's it. They don't at all encourage you to actually do it. I got so many comments on the 3D Land video saying like, you think that's bad beating it twice as Mario and Luigi, Mario 3D World makes you beat the game five times. Like, what are you talking about? No, it doesn't make you do anything. You don't need to do that. It, you don't get anything for it. So don't do it. 
This is actually the first of the 3D games that I had little to no problem with the end game completion stuff, so I gotta give credit where credit is due, but if you really are dead set on getting that shiny profile picture, I guess I'd recommend playing the game once by yourself and then replaying it once more with three friends. That way, you get both the focused single player experience and the chaotic multiplayer experience alongside it. That's probably how you'll get the most out of the game anyway, by playing it multiplayer. I mean, that is what it was designed designed in mind for, after all. So, uh, yeah, there's that game, the Black Sheep of the Mario series. Can we call this one the Black Sheep instead of Mario 2? I mean, like, I think enough time has passed and enough people appreciate and like Mario 2. Like, that game even introduced main mechanics that would be used for the rest of the series, like bob bombs and picking stuff up and Shy Guys even. But this game, people are still split on it. A lot of people love it, but a lot of people hate it. You know, the Black Sheep, that weird multiplayer one that had a lot of really good level design, but still also felt kind of stale because of the sacrifice they made so it could have multiplayer. This is by all means a good game, but when it comes to Mario standards, I totally understand why so many people, myself included honestly, feel it falls a little flat. To some, this is a fantastic multiplayer or single player experience, and to many others, it's just the shoulder shrug of the Mario series that landed on the shoulder shrug of the Nintendo console. So, what's next? <sighs> Super Mario Odyssey. I'll see you guys then.